thank you for the music. God bless each and every one of you. Um, we need more help in our nursery, so if you can sign up and help us. I think Bryce is going to do nursery duty today, and I'm doing it next week. So uh, he really is doing it today. I'm not really doing it next week, but uh, we do need help. All right, so if you can sign up for that. Uh, uh, Emily Dykes, a young girl, had been diagnosed with a brain tumor, and we received notice that they didn't, couldn't find it after uh, this next time she went to the doctor, they couldn't find it, so praise God for that. Um, kids will be dismissed in just a moment uh, after the offering to Junior Church, and so we'll, we'll do, uh, take the offering up in just a moment. You'll have before you these little cups. We're going to do the Lord's Supper at the end of the service. Uh, we're not getting out any later than normal. I'm going to preach a short message today. But there's a fine piece of plastic on the top of it, and you'll have to peel that off to get to the bread. And then underneath that, you peel the next layer off to get to the uh, unfermented wine. So these are in your pew. We thank God for the men that have added some book and, and cup holders in the back row there. We didn't used to have those. I appreciate the guys doing that. Um, let's take our offering. I'm going to ask... Uh, let me see. Um, uh, Brother Joe, Joe O, would you ask the blessing on the offering? Thank you, sir. Well, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. And, and thank you for just all the many blessings you give us. So, uh, Jesus, thank you. Amen. Amen. kids that want to go, follow Brother Wayne out. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to the 118th Psalm. We're looking today into the Jewish believer, into their songbook. And that was, of course, the book of Psalms. And that's what Psalms means. It means song. When you find the 118th Psalm, stand with me and we'll read this. I heard about three, we, we, better, we better read before I tell that joke, but uh, we got all, everybody standing already. If you stand with us, we'll tell that in a moment. But the 118th Psalm, make a mental note of what I say here. Matthew 26, 30. Jesus said, and when they sung the hymn, the scripture says, when they sung the hymn, they went out. And uh, they sung a hymn, they went out. That word hymn is the word psalm. We know they sung something from this book. 
So we're looking at the 118th Psalm here, and we're going to look at several verses. Let's read here these three verses, verses 20 through, through 24, and then we'll pray. <clears throat> the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. God, help us today as we remember your son's death to, to realize the importance of that sacrificial offering, that one-time offering for the sins of the whole world, that we remember that, that we leave here remembering that, and that we are truly grateful on this Thanksgiving day, this Thanksgiving week, to remember what you did for us. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus, for him giving his life for our sins. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you look at this psalm in verse 1, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Scholars believe this song was sung many times in history. If you were to look, we're not going to look right now to Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, you'd find that first verse quoted as they sang in Ezra when they dedicated the temple. And of course, the temple is a type of our Lord as well, and our body is today the temple. But we, he wrote this psalm uh, to remember the Passover. Now, David wrote this under the inspiration of God, a psalm of thanksgiving. Notice in verse 5, the middle of the verse, David talks about the, it says, the Lord answered me. Verse 6, the Lord is on my side. Verse 7, the Lord taketh my part. Verse 14, the Lord is my strength. So back to verse 1, oh, give thanks today. Aren't you thankful for the Lord Jesus today? Amen. He's worthy, worthy of all our praise and all of our thanks. So they gave thanks to him. And that's what we do this week. We thank him. We thank him first. Thank him first for our country, for the Christian heritage of many of our leaders, for our constitution, which much of it is based on the word of God, for the founding fathers that were born again that brought our country into existence. We certainly don't say that our country had a perfect uh, beginning. We, we have uh, sinners today. We've always had sinners. Sinners have been around since uh, the fall of Adam. Uh, we're not bragging on the mistakes we made. We're ashamed of those. But thank God for a country whose foundation was originally based upon the Lord. We thankful, are thankful for that this week as we remember the pilgrims and go back 400 years in our history uh, when they came and they worshiped in this country. Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, verse 15, with great desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. With great desire. Now we look back at verses 22 through 27. In verse 25, we pick up, we're going to read this. Here, this passage, these three verses were, were sung at the Passover. They would sing these three verses. All right? Think of how fitting that is. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even into the horns of the altar. They would actually sing this at the Passover time. Now, as we look back in our history and look at the Passover, we see so much typology pointing to Jesus Christ. You see, when they smote the doorpost of the house with hyssop, they didn't paint the doorpost. The Bible said they smote the doorpost. And they smote the head post. And blood poured down as they killed that lamb. And blood was uh, puddled up underneath the archway of the door. And you, you, you did that. They did that to point ahead, not realizing that pointed ahead to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so we take that across time and we bring it up to today. And David, who wrote this Messianic Psalm, did not realize he was writing about something in the past. He did realize that, but he didn't realize it was connected to a future prophecy, the Lord Jesus on Calvary. And here they, they sang this song, Save Now. And what was it they shouted when Jesus rode into the holy city on the back of an unbroken animal? 
they shouted Hosanna. And that is the Greek word, which means save now. And so this is very prophetic. Then we back up to verses 20 through to, excuse me, our text that we read 22 to 24. The stone which the builders refused. The builders were the Jews. They didn't realize what they were singing. They, the, the builders refused this stone. It has become the headstone of her corner. Now, who's that referring to prophetically? Jesus Christ, the head of the church, the cornerstone of the church. They didn't realize what they were singing but they were singing prophetically about the Lord Jesus. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. And then verse 24 is a very important verse to you to, for you to understand. This is the day, the definite article the. It's talking about a specific day. Quite often we'll sing that chorus or we'll hum it or we'll talk about a day being the day the Lord has made because he's made all days. But this is talking specifically, prophetically, about the day that the stone which was refused by the builders would become the head of the church and the cornerstone. So it's prophetically talking about Jesus. And we sing this chorus. Remember I said in the beginning, remember this mental note that the Bible says when they were done with the Lord's Supper, they sung a hymn and they went out. So we'll sing a little hymn and we'll leave here today. But these three verses, they would sing, they would sing these after Passover. They once again didn't realize it. So when Jesus sits down, he was seated when he did the Lord's Supper. I may sit today. I'm tall enough to see you. But when they sat down and they took the Lord's Supper, they were remembering not only the past, but they were talking about the present. And he goes on to say, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. But here we will sing a psalm, a hymn, and we will go out today and guess what we'll sing? We'll sing this little verse. This is the day, this is the day, and I can't carry a tune. Which the Lord hath made, which the Lord, we will rejoice. We, you know the chorus? We're going to sing that today. I'll lead it. You have to drown me out. You're going to have to hear me again. But that's what we will sing as we leave today. And this is an awesome psalm to read this week during Thanksgiving. I love verse 8. The two middle words of the, of the verse are the Lord, but it says it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. We learn we can't can trust people very much, right? We have a corrupt world, and we have corruption in our, in our country, and, and we have sin in our country. We have sin in our homes. We have sin in our lives. Now we go to the 11th chapter of the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> and we will look here at verses... Uh, 18 through the end of the chapter. We will not be long, but we want to read this together. Verse, I, I love verse 26. We've already quoted it. For as often as you eat the bread and drink this cup, you need to show the Lord's death till he come. So we need to do that. As often, it doesn't say how often. Some churches do it every Sunday. We haven't done it enough here. But right now we have unity. It's a wonderful time to take the Lord's Supper. But we have to talk about the obvious. We have to talk about the things that could be possibly wrong in our lives. We go back to verse 17. Now this I declare unto you, Paul says, under the inspiration of God, I praise you not that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. This church had some real issues. Now, we're not going to preach the whole book of Corinthians, but if we were to go back to chapter 5, the last several verses, and into chapter 6, remember there weren't chapter divisions, he says there are things that you need to put people out of the church for if they're doing these things. Everybody looks up thinking they're going to do that today. No. But it lists several sins there, doesn't it? It says it, it, there's, it's, there's commonly reported that there's fornication in the church. And he describes some of that. There was idolatry. There was uh, extortion. Uh, there were people suing one another. Church people suing other church people. And all those things are mentioned. Uh, sadly, but it also mentions um, division. It, it, several things mentioned in the early part of the book of Corinthians. And so he mentioned those already. But now he picks up again several chapters later in chapter 11 and he names some things that were wrong in the church. Starting in verse 18, the first one he mentions, we're going to mention four, is the word, is the problem of division. Look what it says. For first of all, we cannot come together in the church 
Why? He says, I hear there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. The word division is a Greek word, schisma. We get our word schism from it. It means split, split. You know, it, we, we don't have that going on now, but this church has had a split. Many churches in the area have had splits. That's why you have 800 Baptist churches in this area, and very few are full, because we split and we split and we split. And that, that's a problem in the church. So he says, I hear there's division among you. I, I, I don't like these scriptures, but I love these scriptures. I'm going to quote to you because they're the word of God, but I don't like what they say. The truth always does hurt, doesn't it? God says he hated Enoch. That's interesting. He hated Enoch. Psalm 5.5, 5, you know what the Bible says? God hates all the workers of iniquity. Now, I know God loves the world collectively, but it says God hates the workers of iniquity. And guess what it says in Proverbs chapter 6? These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And it lists several sins. And the last one, it says, and he hates those, referring to people, or he or she, who sow so discord among the brethren. So, I mean, Paul's being very frank here. He said, I believe there's division. I've heard it, and I believe it. And God hates people who sow discord. Now, those are heavy words, I think, of man. Have I done that in my life? I remember years ago, I, I was in the meat business, and I, I cut meat for 10 years, and I was working at ShopRite way up north. And, and uh I had a, a guy in the shop that was causing me a lot of trouble and the other meat cutters a lot of trouble. So I went and did something very clever and got the boss mad at him. But you know what? It was wrong. I did it to divide he and the boss because he was, we used to say he sucked up to the boss. I don't know if it's nice to say that today, but that's what we said then. And so I didn't like it. So I said, I'm going to take care of that. I, got, I saw him doing something. I'm going to let the boss know what he did. And just, it had nothing to do with work, but it turned the boss against him for a while. That felt good. That was wrong. Do you know what? I was a young teenager then. But do you know that happens in the church today? Now, we talk about all these serious sins. We talked about fornication. We mentioned all the things, those things. But you know what? In our own lives, dividing, the things that divide us can be just simple jealousy, envy, bitterness. Those little white lies we tell. We're envious of someone, so we turn someone against them because that way maybe they'll like us better. And that's sad, but that is common in the church today. And it causes division. We've already dealt with division back in chapter 3, so we're not going to go any further on that. But notice verse 19, the second problem the church had. He says, for there must also be heresy among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Basically, he's saying here, uh, so you who have God's approval will be recognized. That's the paraphrase of that last half of the verse. And that word approved in James chapter 1. I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but I'll quickly turn there and read James chapter 1 because that word approved in James 1 is translated tried. He says here, blesses men and endure temptation for when he is tried. So, you know, we're approved in God's eyes because we've been tried or tested. And, and so he says uh, he'll bring those people out to the forefront because there's probably heresy here. Now, what heresy did they have? Many heresies that day. We don't have time to go into them. Gnosticism, there's so many we could talk about. But let's talk about one in the, that could be in the church today. I know we talk about the church collectively, but we have denominations. I won't even classify some of them as people who are born again, but we have people who teach things that are wrong about the Lord's Supper. Some teach that you can't touch the bread or touch the grape juice because it's actually the blood and the body of Jesus. It's not true. It's simple bread and grape juice to cause us to remember the blood and body of Jesus. So we don't need someone to put it on our tongue because it turns into his flesh you know, that's, my dad used to say malarkey. It's just not true. It's heresy. It's false teaching. Look at chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. 
chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians 16 and 17. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? That word could be translated fellowship, that word communion, same word. It's the communion, it's not the blood, it's the communion of the blood. And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Yes, it's the fellowship of Christ's body. It's the communion, we call it today, the Lord's Supper. It's to remember what he did. So they had heresy. They had heresy. And then they had a problem of gluttony. Really, it was more of a problem of just wanting to come to a big feast. Jews love feast. If you study their feast, I'm thinking about if, if I'm here at Easter time doing a series on the various feasts of our Lord and conclude with the Passover feast. That would be so fitting at that time. But Jews love feasts. They love to eat. I know other people that love to eat, right? We, we love to have fellowships. There's nothing wrong with that, but this is not the day to have one. This is the day to concentrate on the Lord's body and the Lord's blood. So they came together, verse 20 says, to eat. For when you come together, therefore, into one place, is this not to eat the Lord's Supper? Drop down to verse 34. If any man hunger, let him eat at home. That's not what this is about. It's not a feast day. It's a day of remembrance, and we know what we're remembering. So they had a problem with eating. They had a problem with drunkenness. Verse 21, B, the last line, and one is hungry and another is drunken. Can you imagine that? Coming to the Lord's Supper and getting drunk? That, that's what some did. And so Paul is upset, and he's scolding them. Why do we use unleavened bread and unaged wine? Well, because Scripture says to use unleavened bread. And we go back to the time of the Passover. When they were getting ready to celebrate the Passover, they would completely empty their house of every dust particle they could find. They would pour all the wine out that had been fermented. They would get rid of all the moldy things, all the bread uh, that was old, anything that had yeast in it, they'd clean completely out of the house because they, were, they didn't realize it. They're, they're celebrating the Passover when the death angel passed over because he saw the blood, right? And the death angel will pass over you because he sees the blood. You're not eternally separated from God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So they got all the age stuff out. And that points ahead, of course, to Jesus because leaven always represented sin. And Jesus Christ is sinless. So we don't remember his death with leavened bread, but with unleavened bread. And unleavened wine. So here they had these problems. But the worst problem was they, that if they had any of these problems, or any of the problems listed before, or any of the ones we talk about in the church today, the problem was, the big problem was unworthiness. Look at verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily, unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of Christ. Did you know it was sin that put Jesus on the cross? Uh, it wasn't just the Romans that put him there or the Jewish leaders, it was sin. Look at verse 31. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, <clears throat> not discerning the body of the Lord. Verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. Do you know? That God sometimes gets so upset with people who don't confess their sin and keep living in sin, he'll take them out of this world. Some died because they lived a life of sin, hypocrisy, celebrating the Lord's Supper, acting as though everything was fine. God got tired of it. Many are sick and many die, it says. Isn't that sad? So we have to make sure we're worthy. You say, Brother Dan, how do we know if we're worthy? How do we know if we should partake? Number one, you need to be born again. Amen. You see, I'm not worthy today to partake of the Lord's Supper because of anything I've done. In fact, the opposite of that is true. You see me as a sinner, but God sees me as worthy because I'm in the Lamb. I'm in the Lamb, and worthy is that Lamb. I'm in Him. So because I'm in him, I'm worthy because my sin's paid for. I've repented and I'm worthy because God made me worthy. Amen. Number two, to be worthy, you need to have your sin confessed. 1 John 1, 9. 
See, Paul's talking to believers and he said, many believers aren't here today because they continued in sin. Shall we continue in sin that God, that grace can abound? God forbid, Romans says. He'll not allow it to happen. Eventually he'll just start chastening and eventually he'll deal with you severely. We can't just continue in sin. We need to confess our sins. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word catheter, that Greek word, and all the junk comes out because you put that yucky tube in. Isn't it wonderful that you've had a catheter a time or two physically in your life? I've had them. You may have had them. Gets the yuck out. Confession gets the yuck out. God cleanses us. The moment we confess, we're clean. We're again worthy. And we can partake of the Lord's Supper. Now think about this. You're not worthy if you have unconfessed sin. And today, if you harbor something in your heart towards someone else, you're not worthy. If you haven't chosen to forgive, you say, Brother Dan, it's hard to forgive. Ask God for his grace. You know, forgiveness is a decision we make. Emotionally, it takes time. But make the decision, I am going to forgive that person. God, give me the grace to help me emotionally with that, but I have forgiven that person. I'm always amazed when I hear of someone who had a child murdered and they find out that person's come to know the Lord. And sometimes these news medias will slip and let us know they're believers and, and the believer will say, I've chosen, I've chosen to forgive. It's very hurtful, but I, I've forgiven. And that's always amazing to me. There's people who've been hurt extremely. But as believers, no matter how extreme our pain is, we need to choose to forgive. Make the decision to forgive. Ask God to give you the grace. I know it'll take time to heal, but some of you may need to forgive someone this morning. You can do that in the pew today. When we have our time of prayer, we'll have a silent time where Sister Joy will play softly. And that's when you say, God, I harbor bitterness towards this person in my life. Please forgive me, God. Because I know if I don't forgive them, then you don't forgive me and I'm not in fellowship and I'm not worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. That's what you pray. And if you're here today and you're not a believer, please pray and receive Jesus as Savior. I want to say to you, I wouldn't care if someone got up right now and said, I need to be saved and came down here. We'd pause the service and we'd show them how to be saved and you could be born again today and then you'd be a child of God and you could partake in the Lord's Supper. Amen. It'd be your first great thrill is taking the Lord's Supper in Christ and you'd be in the worthy Lamb because He's worthy. That would make you worthy. Even though you're a sinner, you're worthy in Him. You're worthy in Him. And so we have to examine ourselves. Verse eight, 28, examine yourself. That really means to discern. That's the Greek word meaning to discern. Christians, you need discernment. You know how to tell what kind of a Christian you are, what level of growth you're at in your life? When you have discernment from the Holy Spirit. And you can sit in your pew now and silently realize and admit, you know what? This is wrong in my life. And if you don't have that kind of discernment, you're not walking with God the way you need to walk with God. You need to have that discernment to say, this is wrong. I don't know what it is in your life, but you do. And use that discernment right now as the Holy Spirit is telling you right now, What's wrong? Confess it. Confess it. Confess it. And he's speaking to you because he lives in you. And when things aren't right, he just sort of stirs the inside. I confess every day my sin every day. You say, well, you're the preacher. That's especially why I need to confess my sin every day. Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. You know what you're looking at? <laughs> a rotten vessel. Saved by the grace of God, thank God. And one day this will be changed, this old body. But this is a sinful body. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? The Lord will when I get my new tabernacle. But until then, I've got a sinful body. 
And my mind can act as though it's depraved. And yet I'm in Christ. And because of what he did, I'm worthy. But when I don't confess it, I'm out of fellowship. And that's what community means, fellowship. And if you're going to take communion today, confess those things. Those things you see as little divide you from Christ. And your relationship is not what it ought to be. So confess your sins. Examine yourself. Verse 31, judge yourself. That means to punish yourself. Just lay the law down with self. And just say, hey, I'm not doing right, and I'm doing right now from this day forward. And, of course, feed yourself, but that's not part of what I wanted to say today. I, I was in a church years ago, and I'll change the order of the service in just a moment. If you guys want to come now, you can. And uh, <clears throat> they said, we have closed communion here, Brother Dan. If you're not a member of this church, then you can't take the Lord's Supper here with us. And I thought, that's fine. But I thought, do you think Paul, when he traveled to the 50-some churches he started would be refused to take the Lord's Supper? No. So that is a teaching that can be wrong if you feel that you have to be a member here, you do not. You have to be a member of the church, meaning the body of Christ. And if you're a member of the body of Christ, then you can partake of the Lord's Supper. God bless us as we change the order of the service. In Jesus' name, amen. We turn to Matthew at this time, Matthew chapter 26, and we will conclude in Matthew 26. As I've already explained, we have in front of uh, in the pew in front of you uh, the little cups, and you need to peel the fine little piece of plastic off right now, and uh, we're going to partake of the bread. I'm going to just peel one of these off to show you. It's just that clear piece. And then you'll find the bread there. If you do that now, you'll be ready. All right? And I'm going to serve the guys here, and then I'll say a word or two. We'll have a time of prayer. This is a socially distancing type of Lord's Supper. And so we're not going to pass the trays to you. You have it in your hands. We look at Matthew chapter 26. And we look at verses 26 and following. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples. We've given it to the disciples already, the followers of Jesus Christ, and you're all followers of the Lord this morning. I'm going to ask Brother uh, Tony to lead us in prayer. And when he's done praying, we're going to have just a time where Sister Joy will just play. And I want you to agree with Brother Tony, but then I want you to take this time to check your own heart, to examine yourself, to judge yourself, to make sure that your heart is right, that your sin is confessed, that you know the Lord Jesus. Brother Tony. Father in heaven, Lord God, as we come before you today, Lord, we come to you in this time, and Lord, we pray that we just examine ourselves, dear God. Lord, that we ask for forgiveness of all of our sins, dear God, and Lord, you ask that you would cleanse us all. Father, this is a special time, Lord, that we remember you, and Lord, the sacrifice that was made over 2,000 years ago for us, dear God, how the blood was shed for us, dear God, and we're so thankful that today, that we can call upon the name of Jesus. In the days where things look dark, Father, we know that you are the light. You are the way, you are the path. Father, I pray that we keep our mind focused on you in this time. In Lord Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.
Thank you, Sister Joy. The Bible says here that Jesus took the bread, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Now, if you take the little piece of purple color and peel that back and grab the whole little tab there and pull it back, you will have, it's not expired, so it shouldn't be fermented. You will have the uh, representation of the Lord's blood. The Bible said he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them. We're going to ask uh, Brother Lloyd if you'll bless the cup this morning. Our precious Heavenly Father, I'm telling you, we sung many songs to this today about the blood. Thank you for the precious blood that shed on Calvary. We know that the Bible says about the shedding the blood, there's no redemption. Thank you for the simple verse in John 3.16 that says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you for that shed blood. Thank you, Lord, to love you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Sister Joy. The Bible says that Jesus took the cup and gave it to them and said, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins. He went on to say, But I will not, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then the Bible says, stand with me, it says, and they, when they sung the hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. So we're going to sing that little chorus. If Joy doesn't, do you, do you know how to play that little chorus, Joy? If not, that's okay. We're going to sing that little chorus found in Psalm 118. This is the day. And we think as we leave, as we're singing this little chorus, about that day. Amen. That's what David was writing about. So let's sing together. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice.
bless you, you're dismissed.